Hi everyone, welcome to this second lecture of Mechanics of Solids. Uh, in the previous lecture, we discussed what Mechanics of Solids is. Uh, more specifically, we discussed that mechanics is actually finding out the internal effects due to the uh, loads which are applied on structures. So in the current class, we will go a bit deeper into internal effects. We will discuss stresses and strains in structures. So both of them are internal effects. We consider a structure which is subject to some loading. So you see this uh, structure and it has uh, got loading applied to it, F1, F2, F3 and F4. Uh, this structure has got some UDL loading also, uniformly distributed loading. And this structure is supported at some point. So this is just a general structure. To be more specific, this can be a simply supported structure, for example, which is a beam on simple supports and subjected to loading. So this figure is just a generic figure of structures. So in general, loadings can be categorized into two different types. One is surface uh, loads and another one is body loads or body forces. Surface loads, as the name suggests, they are the loads which are applied on surface. So all the forces which you can see uh, over here in this sketch, they are all surface loads. The body load is that load which is applied on the whole volume. So the example of body load can be the self-weight. This structure will have its own weight and that weight lies at the center of gravity. In our structure engineering, uh, we normally have self-weight as a body load. In this course, we would be omitting the body loads. So we will only consider the surface loads. Uh, the reason being that in most of the cases, the surface loads are so big that the body loads can be ignored. In order to define this structure in space, it is important to uh, come up with certain coordinates. So uh, why? Because Coordinates are essential to define anything within a space. We assume the simple Cartesian coordinates as our system. Since we are interested in finding out the internal effects, we have to somehow cut this structure and find out what the internal forces are. For that, we use a super sharp knife and we chop this uh, structure at any inclination. So we have uh, got this exploratory section, imagining that's a knife and that can cut this structure. Uh, we omit one part of the structure, just consider a portion of the structure, but apply the effect of the omitted part onto the uh, considered structure. So how do we do that? First of all, we have to recall Newton first law and Newton third law of motion. Newton first law is a body at rest will stay at rest and a body in, at motion will stay at motion until and unless it is impelled by some unbalanced force. If we consider static structure, in other words, no dynamic effects are considered, then this body under the applied load should remain in equilibrium. It shouldn't move together. Uh, the applied force and the reaction, their forces cancel out. So the body is in equilibrium. If the applied force for some reason become higher than the uh, reactions at the support, then the body will start moving because of the unbalanced force. So that static condition will be disturbed. Another important uh, law which we will be using in this course is the Newton third law. The third law states that every action has got equal and opposite reaction. So as I said, if we want to consider the internal effects of uh, this structure, we have to omit one structure. But if we omit the structure, we have to apply the effects onto the remaining structure. Internally, there would be some forces 
and those forces are all balanced that's why the whole structure is considered in equilibrium if a portion of the structure is removed then unbalanced force will appear on the surface and this these unbalanced force must be counteracted by the effects of the portion which is removed from the section we assume that the surface we are interested in is made up of very small areas or very small cubes as you can see over here every surf every face of this cube has got some forces so there are some forces which are parallel to the plane and there are some forces which are perpendicular to the plane the forces which are perpendicular to the plane they are facing outward and the forces which are parallel to the plane uh, they are lying within the plane thus when we remove this portion of the body from the rest of the body we would have an imbalance within these forces please remember that all these internal forces they are zero because of action and reaction if one portion of the structure is removed then these forces will become imbalanced or to rebalance them we have to apply some set of forces onto the remaining structure in short what we are saying is that the equilibrium in every direction of our coordinate axis must be equal to zero please remember that equilibrium has got force and the moments so force and moment in every direction must be zero so the figure clearly shows that every axis has got axial force and a moment and that axial force and moment must be equal to zero the force which we can see in the figure that is actually the average of infinite number of forces acting in that particular direction we normally consider coplanar forces in other words uh, we assume that our structure has got only forces applied in a uh, in particular plane and the out of plane forces are assumed nil we ease our calculation by considering forces in one particular plane now let us discuss the idea of stress as we said that the surface of our interest has got uh, distributed loading or there are infinite loading on the surface this is very common in mechanics that if we have distributed loading uh, along particular axes then we try to find out the resultant of those loads and instead of considering all these loads we just consider the resultant force so in this figure the forces which are shown they are actually resultant forces one thing to appreciate in the case of this uh, body uh, is that it is made up of a continuous and cohesive material in other words by continuity we mean that the whole body is one mass there are no cracks or there are no gaps in the body by cohesion we mean that the atoms are all sticking with each other uh closely and we don't have a uh, gaps or a uh, spaces in the structure so together the continue continuity and cohesiveness give us a homogeneous body the reason we are taking uh, continuity and cohesiveness is that we want to define the stresses the whole surface is assumed to be made up of infinite square areas uh, making up the surface each area is considered as delta a so on a particular area within this surface there will be a force delta x acting 
So what we have done is that instead of considering all the distributed forces within a, uh, within this surface, we focus on a very small area, delta A, which has the force delta Fx appearing. Then we try to make this area very close to zero and we get the definition of a stress. So stress is actually the average force per unit area. The force can be either in tension or compression. Since stress represents force per unit area, then according to SI system, the uh, unit of stress is Newton per square meter. This is also called Pascal's, written as PA. In the foot pound second system, we can have the stress unit as uh, kilopounds per square inch KSI or pound per square inch PSI. We can have the stress units in other systems also, but the SI and the foot pound system are the most common one. In this figure, I'm just further elaborating on the distributed loads on the surface. I'm trying to average the normal stress distribution. As we discussed that in this body, we can have forces appearing in all the direction and distributed all along the surface or the area. So that is shown over here. We have got infinite axial forces uh, on this area. Again, on the small area, we assume that there is stress sigma, and that si stress sigma can be multiplied with the infinitesimal area to get the force on that area. So this is just the same thing as we have done over here. If we know the stress, then we can multiply that with the uh, with any infinitesimal area and we can find the force and that has that is being done over here so the n force is required on a differential area we multiply the stress with that and the, uh, and then we can integrate that on both sides so over here we get the normal force and from this side we get total area of the cross section Please note, sigma is the stress on this whole area. So that is a constant. That's why this sigma will come out of the integral. From this equation, we can write sigma is equal to n by a. Now let us do a few examples which will further clear our concept. We have got a rod on which variety of forces are applied. This example is taken from Hebler. The reason I am dwelling on this problem is that I want you to appreciate all the forces within a static system must add up to zero or we would have an imbalance force and that would uh, induce some acceleration in the structure. So the summation of Fx, x, uh, taking x along the axis of this bar must give us 17 rather than 22. So therefore, this is wrong. It's 17 in reality. Uh, in this problem, we are asked to find out the maximum average normal stress. Now, the maximum average normal stress might be appearing somewhere within the structure. And first of all, we have to find out where uh, the location is. The cross section is 35 millimeter wide and 10 millimeter thick. So the first step is to decompose this structure into different parts. So as you can see, first part is AB and every part should be balancing out. So as you can see that the summation of Fx on this part must be equal to zero. This idea is supporting what we said over here that our, we have got a whole body and we take just portion of this body. So the rest of the portion effect incorporated onto the body. So this 12 kilonewton at this point is telling us that if we remove the rest of the body, 
then we'll have to apply 12 kilonewton load at this point so that the effect of this omitted part is incorporated. Similarly, if we cut this in uh, somewhere in BC uh, region, we would have 21 kilonewton applied at this point in order to uh, uh, in order to ensure equilibrium. So we have uh, 12 kilonewton plus 9 kilonewton, and summation of from summation of fx must be equal to zero. This is this should be 12 plus 9, which is 21 kilonewton. The same argument applies over here. If we assume that CD uh, that is cut from CD, then at that point, it should be 12 plus 9 minus 4, because 4 is in the opposite direction, and CD will come out to be 17 kilonewton. We can also draw the axial force diagram. So in AB, we have 12 kilonewton. Then in BC, we have 21 kilonewton. And then it drops down to 17 kilonewton. And finally, at D, we have 17 kilonewton. From inspection, we can say that uh, 21 kilonewton is the maximum axial force. So 21 has been taken, divided by area and we get 60 megapascal stress. This stress is the maximum stress. Please note that we are always interested in the maximum stresses within a structure. The reason is that the area which is, which is having maximum stress, that area will have the chance of getting failed first. Let us move to this second example, which where we have got a uh, 80 kilogram lamp that is supported by two rods a b and b c uh, a b has a 10 millimeter dia and b c has 8 millimeter dia just to find out the average normal stress in each rod this is a simple example of cable first of all we have to find out the force in each cable so uh, or in each rod so b a and BC forces that can be found using method of joints. We have summation of Fx is equal to zero, summation of Fy is equal to zero. That will give us the forces in these cables, in, the, in these rods. Area, we can easily find AB diameter is 10 millimeters. So use a phi, uh, so phi D squared by four, and we get a 25 phi millimeter square for AB. Similarly, we can find area for BC. If we have forces and we have areas, we can divide the respective force by the respective area and get the stresses in both the parts. Now let us discuss the concept of strain. In order to fully understand strain, we have to understand how the deformation works. Whenever a force is applied to a body, it will tend to change its shape and size. These changes are called deformation. For example, a rubber band which is stretched will deform and that stretch is called deformation. The deformation can be uh, visible or unnoticeable. In case of rubber band, they are visible. But if we take an example of a building structure, the deformation in the structure components are invisible. If the deformation become visible within a building structure, then that means the building is not living worthy. The deformations are not uniform throughout the body. So uh, the change in geometry of any line segment within the body may vary substantially along its length. Now imagine we have got this rod and we are trying to stretch it. Let us say we divide the bar into eight blocks. Each block is of same length, delta S. If we stretch the bar by load P, then the deformation of the blocks will be different. The total sum of deformation will be equal to delta, but the deformation of the blocks will be different. The reason that the deformation is different is that there can be stress concentration or there can be some uh, problem with the material. 
In order to describe the deformation of a body by changes in the length of the line segment and changes in the angle between them, we need to develop the concept of strain. Strain is actually measured experimentally, and once we get it, uh, we can relate it to the applied stress by relationship, which we will discuss in the future class. The normal strain is equal to change in length by the original length. This is called strain average, and that is equal to L minus L naught by L, as shown over here. This L minus L naught, this is the deformation, delta. As we discussed that we can divide the, uh, the length into very small segments, and each segment will have different deformation, considering, well, the length of all the segments are equal. We can also work out the strain of a particular segment by subtracting delta S dash, which is the length of the deformed segment from the original length of undeformed segment and divide it by the original length delta S of the undeformed segment. That will give us the normal strain at a point. Strain is a dimensionless quantity. Its unit is in length per unit length. Let us discuss a problem. We are given this arrangement where we have got two wires, AB and AC. A is the meeting point of these two wires. Uh, these wires are attached to the roof at D and C. We are asked to find out the strain in both of these wires. Remembering that strain is equal to change in length by original length, we need to find out first of all the original length. We can work out the original length by considering Pythagoras theorem. So this is three, this is four. So the original length of both of these wires should be five meter. The deformed length of the wire is given to us. So this wire, the point A moves 20 millimeter vertically it moves 10 millimeter horizontally please notice that point a is being pushed to the left in order to find out the deformed length of a dash b we can use again the pythagoras theorem where the vertical distance will be 4 plus 0 0.02 and the horizontal distance will be 3 minus 0 0.01, which is given 3 minus 0 0.01 and 4 plus 0 0.02 whole square. square. So, similarly, the A dash C will be equal to 4 plus 0 0.02 and 3 plus 0 0.01. 3 plus 0 0.01 whole square plus 4 plus 0 0.02 whole square. Everything under square root. After finding out the deformed lengths, we can subtract the deformed length from the original length and then divide it by the respective original length to get the respective strain. And that has been done. The change in length for original length for AB and change in length for, for original length for AC. Let us do this another example. So we have got a rod which is hung from point D and load P is applied at point C on this rod. Uh, the distance DB is 300 millimeter and distance AB is 400 millimeter. We are told that the arm rotates clockwise about A by 0 0.05 degree. So this moves by 0 0.05 degree. We have to determine normal strain in the wire BD. Our strain is change in length by original length. The original length is 300 millimeters, so that is given. The change in length is the extended length minus the original length. So in order to find out the extended length, we have to first find out the distance AD. Distance AD always stay constant so that we can find out from here. Once distance AD is found, we already know distance AB, which stays constant. 
we can find out the distance dv dash using the cosine formula. So in order to find out phi, which is the angle between AD and AB prime, we have to first find angle alpha. Angle alpha can be found from the tangent inverse 400 by 300. Now the angle phi is 90 minus alpha plus 0 0.05 degree. So this angle plus 0 0.05 degree. This angle is 90 minus alpha as written over here and 0 0.05 is added to find out uh, to get phi. And once phi is found and the lengths are worked out, we can use the cosine formula to get our length. Once the deformed length is worked out, then it can be subtracted from the original length and we can get the strain.